experiences in pregnancy dramatically um, impacts their, uh, their long-term health and how those uh, impacts can last for decades. And uh, finally, and perhaps most excitingly, um, this uh, intersectional approach to how we can uh, uh, approach uh, maternal health inequities uh, internationally. Um, this series, I think, comes at a particularly critical time. Um, we know that the Sustainable Development Goals since 2015, um, we're rapidly approaching um, the 2030 milestone, but we are all um, very concerned about the fact that maternal, maternal mortality uh, rates appear to have stagnated, and indeed in some countries, and have gone up. And it would be a fair criticism to say that we are in a fast changing world, um, but perhaps our strategies uh, are not uh, adapting quickly enough um, to that changing environment. And this just merely underscores the need that we need fresh approaches and, and fresh thinking if we are to try to drive down maternal mortality and, um, and redress these inequities. And that was the basis um, for this series about how we can um, challenge ourselves to think differently about how we can make broader impacts for women for pregnant women um, and indeed around the time of childbirth and their babies, but indeed for, for their future health and future generations. So this series was an attempt to bring together um, these new perspectives in a scientific way. Um, it is an extraordinary collaboration. We um, in this series had more than 100 collaborators uh, from more than 25 countries. And we're extremely proud of the fact that uh, over two thirds of those authors were from uh, low middle, upper middle income countries. and. I think that keeping that um, that international uh, focus at the heart of this series was really important. And we had collaborators from a range of backgrounds, uh, a range of disciplines, um, and a range of career levels, including people in their um, early in their research and maternal health careers. Um, today we have four presenters to walk us through um, this fantastic series, and really excited and appreciative of all of them um, joining us today. Um, I'm going to um, start the session with our first speaker. Um, I first want to uh, introduce and hand over to Dr. Anoma uh, Jayapalaka. Um, Anoma, she is a medical officer uh, in maternal and reproductive health at the Southeast Asia Regional Office for WHO. Um, she herself is a medical doctor with uh, experience, expertise, and extensive training in, uh, in public health but a, a more than 30 year career focusing across maternal and reproductive health issues, um, both at country and, uh, and regional office levels. Um, she has a very special interest and a deep dedication to maternal mortality reduction in low income settings. Um, so it's very, my very great delight uh, to hand over to you, Anoma, to uh, walk us through the highlights uh, of the first paper from the, uh, the Lancet series. So over to you. Thank you, uh, the Joseph, for the kind uh, introduction. And then, uh, can you go to the slide, please? Yeah, uh, so I'll just talk about that, what Southeast Asia region, actually, actually not about the papers, but it's how it's applicable to us. And then it's really in good time that it's all these papers are coming. And then, uh, I think it's not moving. Okay, uh, so, uh, Okay, the Southeast Asia region is we are having in uh, WHO Southeast Asia region is 11 countries. And then uh, uh, I'm not going to explain about it. And then it's, but we are contributing actually for the 26% of the global population, uh, world's population and 25% of the total annual birth in the world. So after, out of these 11 countries, eight countries are low middle income countries and one in low income countries and two are only upper middle income countries. So it's a wide variety. But in the, when you look at about maternal mortality ratio that we have done well, uh, and then in the Southeast Asia region is one of the WHO region, it has reduced maternal mortality ratio significantly in the past decades. So you can see even in the, uh, compared to the other regions that we have done about 78% reduction uh, during the past period. So, but if you look at about MMR uh, in our region, that uh, is still 117 per 100,000 for a WHO, uh, the, the region. And then also what we said that uh, we are contributing for 13% of the global maternal deaths is 39,000. And then four deaths per hour and 3,200 deaths per month. It's, it's really unacceptable. And then if you look at this is complicated uh, uh, slide, but yet I'll try to explain. And then when you look at about the maternal MMR reduction from 2000 to 2020, 
and then possibility of achieving the SDG target. I know that SDG target for material mortality ratio is quite uh, complicated, but the global target is only 70, but yet uh, 70 or less, but for a country has to be reduced. Uh, all countries should be less than 140 in 2030. And then uh, the uh, the MM, uh, e EPMM target for the country, national target is two third reduction from the 2010 value. But if you look at in 2000, that all the countries had really very high mortality, except very few countries had their very low mortality like Sri Lanka and Thailand. And then if you look in 2020, but you can see this all uh, the third column and then all uh, yellow countries are they are already less than 140. Uh, and then when you look at about the fourth column, that is their target in according to the uh, the EPMM target, they are, where they should uh, go uh, in 2030 as a MMR target. But when you look at about this other column, that is a MMR 2030 projection. So if you go this. ARR, annual rate of reduction, that is the last column. ARR is not very sick, good in uh, most of the countries. In uh, 2060 to 2020, that Bangladesh is having the highest, and then Myanmar, and the Nepal, and then uh, Timor-Leste. But other all countries, it's having a very low ARR, annual rate of reduction. If you apply this uh, 2020 value, and then this annual rate of reduction, where are you ending? is in the this column that you can see only four countries are on track to achieve this two-third reduction. That is Bangladesh, Myanmar, Nepal, and uh, Timor-Leste. But you know that in the two countries now already having some uh, issues in the civil uh, rights. And then, uh, uh, so when you look at about this, is this is applicable for these papers. We can see that uh, this is where we have stagnated. Uh, you can see that in Bangladesh, actually starting from phase one MMR, and then they have shifted to the phase three. But if you see that you know, most of the countries now in 2020, they are in the either phase three. Most of the countries in the phase three, you can see Indonesia is already in the phase three, stagnant, stagnant from 2000, uh, 2000 to 2020. And if you look at Sri Lanka and Thailand, low mortality countries, they are in the phase 4A. They were stagnant from phase 4A from 2000 to 2020. So this is the issue. And then uh, that uh, I, this is quite applicable in these papers that we need to be have a, a appropriate strategies based on these countries, why these countries are stagnant, and then what can we uh, 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 implement uh, to reduce material mortality in a uh, depend on their specific uh, uh, mortality phase. Uh, so if you look at about the causes of death, you can see still in our region is mainly direct causes. Direct causes are the, re uh, the uh, for the reason for death and then there are indirect deaths are in increasing in the way the MMR has come down. So uh, then if you look at about evidence-based interventions, if you look at few intervention, you can see at least four A and C. Still, we have a gap of 37% in the region. This is the cumulated gap. And then also the skill birth attendance, there's a 13% gap. And the institutional de delivery, there is a, only 83% happening in the institution and then 17% gap. And the cesarean section is we are, most of the settings we are do, overdoing it. And then also uh, the postnatal care, there is a gap for 35% for mothers, only we are doing postnatal care, uh, 65%. And then for the babies, it's a little better. And then uh, uh, to protection against uh, tetanus, is, there's uh, only 86%. So, uh, so that means we have to do. So then this is again uh, the important area, inequity in the intervention coverage. So I have shown that even the inequity in the MMR, maternal mortality ratio, but also inequity within the country as well as among the country. But you can see even in the uh, the most of the, the if you look, look at the geographical inequity and then uh, that the urban and rural area, you can see that some uh, some interventions, there is a real, uh, there is a gap and then inequity in maternal education. So you can see that skill birth attendance and the antenatal care, there's a clear things even the postnatal care and the wealth inequity. 
among these selected indicators. So this is an area that we have to be addressed because of further reduction that inequities affect mainly on uh, that we, we, we need to work on these strategies. But most of our program does not look at directly on these things. This is are the, these are the uh, gaps. So, in a summary, Southeast Asia region has been considerable progress in reducing maternal mortality, the highest decline in the last decade. But yet, as despite variable progress, most countries are not on track to achieve the national target on MMR. I think when the globally also this is the situation, which are two-third reduction from the 2010 value. Some countries are stagnant for a long time in the same mortality phase, such as phase three or phase four. Gap in coverages, quality, and equity has seen in a, as a major areas to be addressed. And then also that uh, this is the biggest area of the problem. So still, uh, the most of the member states are focusing the programs on survival, They're only the mortality productions and program need to be expanded to address the beyond survival and other areas such as mental health, well-being, and so many so, so areas that we need to be uh, looking into that. So uh, in the way forward, hmm, so way forward, so that we need to be uh, accelerate the uh, ARR and ac the accelerate the AR annual rate of reduction in maternal newborn and stillbirth reduction, implementing high impact strategies based on the level of mortality or stage of obstetric transition and fertility. Because the fertility is also extremely important that its family planning activities will contributing reduction of mortality. So we have to work on the holistic approach. Then also equitable scaling up of coverages of life-saving intervention is required to be, uh, that is no one left behind. And then also strengthen health system. So we cannot forget about health system. So the, and then also mainly the domestic financing and addressing HR issues related to MNH workforce. And also uh, that the program has to be focused on uh, uh, the, um, the beyond the survival state. So I think this is my last slide. And then thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity. Thanks very much, Anoma, indeed. Really appreciate that, um, that high-level view of the situation in our region, and I think in some ways reflective of um, what we're facing as a, as a planet, a, um, a real story of mixed progress and concerningly high um, burdens um, across the region and indeed um, across the world. Um, and we really appreciate you being here with us to share that data, Anoma, and give that regional focus. Um, I will mention to people that uh, you are very welcome to, um, of course, introduce yourself and let us know who you are and where you're from in the chat. Uh, we love hearing uh, what kind of group are joining uh, in today. And also we'll really encourage people to post any uh, questions they may have for our presenters in the chat. Um, what we'll do today is we'll work through our presentations and then we will um, have some time at the end to um, to get into a bit more of a discussion about the uh, the findings of the series, questions you might have, um, and where we might go as a community um, between now and uh, and the end of the SDGs in in twenty thirty. Um, so on that note, I'll uh, I'll move to our next presenter. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Rintaro Mori, and uh, Dr. Mori is a global health practitioner and pediatrician. Um, he's worked for over 25 years uh, in the fields of women's, newborns, and children health, and more broadly, uh, across population development, health, social systems, sustainability, and health policy. Um, he's worked at community, international, uh, national, and international levels. Um, he's also been involved in policy development, not just in uh, the Asia uh, Pacific region, but uh, in the UK and uh, beyond as well. Uh, unfortunately, we've had some um, issues with Rintaro being able to join us live today, um, but we've been very fortunate to be able to bring um, his perspective, his expertise um, in the series uh, through recording. So I'll just um, hand to my colleague, Tina, if you could um, um, share that presentation from your side. Good morning and good afternoon and a good evening, colleagues in Asia Pacific. My name is Ritaro Mori. I'm based in Japan and I'm pleased and honored to present 
this first paper. This paper is about determinants of maternal health and the transigence in the maternal mortality. I am actually presenting on behalf of these contributors I'm showing here. The context is in the 2030 agenda, and maternal mortality is a very important priority and is not progressing what we expected. So this is really important area at work. And the background is the maternal mortality, most of the maternal mortality remains preventable and largely clustered among the social economically disadvantaged women. And we know that. And also, um, the common approach has been direct investment to address the leading biomedical causes, which we question, right? So what we did in this first paper, we analyzed the distal and proximal determinants of maternal health, as well as exposures, risk factors, and the microcorrelates related to the maternal mortality, and examined the relationship between determinants and the country's transition in maternal mortality. There are two actually sort of the uh, literature reviews we worked on, as well as analysis of available data related to the progress towards the sustainable development of goals. The first paper, we actually reviewed the papers looking at framework, framework of frameworks of the determinants of maternal health. The second part, it's about sort of the second literature review, has multiple sources of review. The so first one, we looked at whole systemic reviews covering microcoreates, risk factors, exposures associated with the maternal mortality. That's a literature review, a systemic review. The second one, we have also used the findings of systemic analysis of the databases causes on the maternal mortality to inform our list of medical medical causes of maternal mortality as well. And in addition to these two, we included data from multi-country studies on pregnancy complications and maternal neomesis to inform a comprehensive mapping of individual factors and exposure to maternal mortality, maternal health. So this is a framework we worked on, got super determinants and got so social determinants and exposure level, you know, and lifestyle individual factors or the individual level. Then we all have the sort of the, uh, the uh, factors on the health system and all actually affecting maternal survival and well-being. This is a framework we got. I'm gonna explain further. So in terms of super determinants, you know, the super determinants do present the underlying context and the forces of broadly influence women's health and well-being before, during, and after pregnancy. So the things like sort of the biosphere, like a climate ecosystem, is also the sort of one of the super determinants as well as the nature, natural features of a human species, and the economic, political, and the cultural basis of society. Adaptation to different environment challenges over time encouraged the development of the social structures and cooperative behaviors culminating in country, cultural issues, social norms, political structures, and economy. You know, these are the very important sort of determinants and these are actually affect on human being homo sapiens as a sort of the, you know as a person so these actually sort of the dominant species on the planet you know human impact over time such as deforestation industrialization and pollution have found profound effects on the environment and all affecting maternal survival and well-being so we started from the big picture. Whatever sort of social determinants of maternal health, we looked at more than the individual level. Social determinants for health are derived from the economic, political, and the cultural super determinants and are defined as a non-biomedical factors, influence health risks and outcomes throughout life. Other individual factors, oh, sorry, the social determinants of maternal health when we looked at the literature, they, these are the very important sort of the uh, the factors among the sort of the you know uh, the you know extensive list of the sort of the determinants. 
First one is a gender. Second, ethnicity. And third, social economic class. These are three major uh, determinants in the context of social determinants, maternal health. That's what we found. What about the individual level factors and exposures contributed to maternal health? The individual X factors and exposures to external agents and their lifestyles all impact on maternal health. For example, exposure to external agents, including physical, chemical, and biological hazards, infections, accidents, and violence. These are very important sort of exposures to external agents. The second one is lifestyle. Lifestyle is influenced by the super determinants, particularly culture, political, and economic systems. Lifestyle patterns, in turn, mitigate or elevate risk of the dying or suffering pregnancy related to ill health as well. Individual risk factors and exposures to external the agent and lifestyle all impact on maternal health, yes. And these are actually sort of the, uh, the specific to each pregnant woman and span, age, genetics, and pre-existing health conditions, and mindset. These are shaped by family and community characteristics. These are very important sort of the individual factors as well at the second level. And also interplay between maternal health determinants um, and the concept of embodiment. For example, the first one, pregnant woman is at the center of the dynamic and multifaceted web of interactions between super determinants, social determinants, her, and her individual level factors, exposures, and lifestyle, all combined all together to come in. M. So we know that they're interacting to, together. And these determinants are interconnected and interrelated with each factor continuously, influencing and being influenced by others. So this collectively shaped the maternal health outcomes throughout pregnancy, childbirth, and postpartum period. For example, the climate and environment in which pregnant women if it can impact their health, extreme weather events or poor air or water quality and exposure to pollutants can directly on that or indirectly influence maternal health outcomes as well. What about the role of the health system in the maternal health? Health system and also the other commodities can have modified the effect of the ecosocial forces that lead to adverse maternal health outcomes. It can naturalize, neutralize, or minimize the damaging effects of risk factors. Quality care emerges as a center attribute to the health services that exert protective effects on maternal health as well. On the other hand, health services certainly can be permeable to social forces. For example, inequality in health access to health services a big factor, mistreatment as an expression of sexism as well. Maternal health determinants in the transition in maternal mortality is also what we considered. The absolute number of the maternal mortality and the MMR is gradually reduced, reducing globally. The first world by estimates in the 1980s and early 1990s indicated nearly 500,000 maternal deaths per year. Three decades later, the world has almost half the number, half the numbers. Building on the demographic and epidemiological, epidemiological and a nutritional transition, a transition model to describe the journey from high to low mortar, maternal mortality at the country level also was developed. Maternal health is a product of a multifactorial process. We all know social development, reproductive health indicators, biomedical causes of maternal mortality, certainly, and the organization in the quality of health care. In other words, as a social development versus advances, maternal mortality tends to decrease. So, Public available data, available data was analyzed in addition to literature review to address the issues. 
And also these data are classified and analyzed according to the level of maternal mortality ratio. We used that, the, you know, the previous report by WHO, UNICEF, UNFP and World Bank called 10 trends in the maternal mortality, 2000 to 2020. Transition is a continuous process where stage is based on the level of maternal mortality used to identify patterns to associate it with each level of maternal mortality. What we found is out of 185 countries, 121 have failed to significantly, significantly reduce the level of maternal death over the past two decades. Shocking numbers. So this is actually, you know, the, um, the all, you know, these 121 countries remain the same stage. It's concerning. So the, I think the, um, we are going to sort of give you a kind of summary, sort of the key messages, what we got from our work. First one, what we found is that maternal health is a social issue. Maternal ill health and disability are not just medical problems but also social issues influenced by complex interplay of factors. The second is complexity of maternal health promotion. Addressing maternal health and reducing maternal mortality is a complex endeavor due to both modifiable and unmodifiable factors that impact outcomes. So all in many, many different factors all interlinked together. So it's a complex issue. So that means that we need a broad approach. Focusing solely on the biomedical causes of maternal mortality is not sufficient. A broader approach is necessary to tackle determinants that act upstream in the chain of events, leading to severe morbidity or death. However, we are stagnating in progress. Many countries have remained in the same maternal mortality transition stage of the case, possibly due to a narrow focus on biomedical causes. So multi-sectoral actions is required, achieving sustainable maternal mortality reduction necessitates the multi-sectoral sectoral approach, including efforts to promote social determinants and gender equality. So we also need to think of these sort of the bigger factors, factors taken into account. And role of the health sector is very important. It's critical. So the health sector plays a critical role in rescuing women with pregnancy complications should be expanded to mitigate the impact or determinants of maternal mortality. Still, it remains a very important player. Quality commodities and services needed. Expanding demand and access to reproductive health services and the quality commodities, including the prevention, unsafe abortion, modern contraceptions, and antenatal, interpartum, and postnatal care are needed for primary prevention, early identification, and adequate management of pregnancy complications. Universal health coverage. Achieving universal health coverage, not, not just actually sort of the pregnant woman, but it's including, you know, ordered maternity care, is essential to reducing maternal mortality and ensuring access to quality of care during pregnancy and childbirth in the context of universal health coverage. Very important. Thank you very much. Thanks very much indeed uh, to our colleague uh, Rintaro Mori for that um, really interesting and I think provocative uh, presentation of one of the papers from the uh, Lancet uh, Global Health and Eclin Med series. Um, I think Rintaro's presentation I think is a real reminder for us all, particularly um, if any of you like me came from clinical or perhaps scientific backgrounds you know, we probably bring a bias, you know, a tendency to see pregnancy through a biological lens, or we might see it as something that needs to be solved through tests and drugs. 
Um, but I think Rintaro uh, and the team uh, on this paper are challenging us to see something much bigger and much more complicated. Um, that women and their health, uh, their health in pregnancy and childbirth and postpartum is at the intersection of these, what they've called super determinants, you know, society, environment, um, gender, economics, and health systems. Health systems is a part, a, a critical part, but a part of something um, much, uh, much more complex. And for those of us working in, in health services and programs, we need to, you know, embrace that complexity if we're going to try to redress uh, some of these uh, stubborn and stagnant patterns that Rintaro uh, and Anoma have raised. Um, but with that, um, I'd like to move um, to our next uh, presenter. Um, and it's my very great pleasure, uh, pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Jamila Sheikh. And uh, Dr. Sheikh, she is a academic foundation doctor in London. And I will say that Jamila is actually on clinical service right now. I'm sure the emergency department is um, probably knocking at her door. So we're really grateful that she's able to join us all here today. Um, Jamila is not just a doctor, also an early career researcher uh, with a special interest in global maternal health and maternal inequities. And she is one of the lead authors um, on the uh, one of the papers in this four paper series. Um, and she undertook this research um, at the WHO Collaborating Centre for Global Women's Health at the University of Birmingham uh, with her colleague, Professor Shakila Thangaratnam. So uh, Jamila, a great pleasure to have you here and uh, handing over to you for your uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Perfect, thank you. It's great to be here today to showcase our work on paper two, which investigates the vulnerabilities and reparative strategies that happen and can happen during pregnancy, childbirth and postpartum. Um, I'd like to thank the many collaborators we had on this paper, particularly Professor Thangaratnam and Dr. Oladapo, and of course my first co-author, um, Dr. Lotti, um, who I'm presenting on behalf of. Uh, see slides moving on. Yeah. Health vulnerability is a state where an individual or group of individuals is exposed to physical, physical, psychological, and cognitive or social risk factors in the context of adequate support or coping strategies to neutralize potential adverse effects of these risk factors. In the context of maternal health, this translates to inherent physiological and physical changes that makes a woman's body susceptible to health conditions such as anemia and gestational diabetes. It goes on further to include emotional and physiological changes that are associated with pregnancy and the transition to motherhood, such as anxiety and depression, and also includes limited access to healthcare, education and economical resources that are present in, in women throughout their pregnancy, childbirth and even in their postpartum period. Therefore, in this paper, we aim to map and provide framework for vulnerability concepts in, the, in, in, in maternity health, and also report associations between these attributes and pregnancy outcomes based on the literature. We wanted to show the dynamic influence of these interlinked vulnerability attributes and provide evidence of the reparative strategies that currently exist. We did this by undertaking several um, we did this by undertaking several systematic review of reviews which map the evidence existing across definitions of vulnerability concepts, the associated outcomes and reparative strategy of outcomes as well. This was quite a, a, a big piece of work and hopefully I get to summarize this in this short presentation. So through our first initial review of surrounding the definitions of vulnerability concepts, we identified four systematic reviews in the context of pregnancy and childbirth. Each review posed the model with overlapping similarities, and we use these types of models to formulate our own framework, which we hope to present to you today. So this, this is the framework that you can find in paper two, it's panel two, um, and we incorporated three main categories of vulnerability attributes. These are termed threat, which includes physiological, biological, and sociological subcategories, barriers, which uh, can be described as, for example, poor access to healthcare, and also the concept of repair in the vulnerability journey in during pregnancy and childbirth. 
In this concept, threat represents any potential harm that a woman can um, experience, that even, which is yet to occur, and whereas repair refers to the extent in which vulnerabilities could be minimised, such as, example, training of healthcare professionals or even women's empowerment. We mapped all these vulnerability factors, such as uh, things found in the second column, to the attributes shown in our paper. I'm hoping this figure, figure one in our paper, shows a good example of the vulnerability trajectory that we that we explained. It basically represents that um, the trajectory a woman can experience during pregnancy and childbirth as a net balance of the threat, barriers, and reparative strategies. Pre-existing threats, including inherent threats due, due to a pregnancy state and barriers can, that, that are involved throughout a woman's trajectory for health. The threats and barriers can become cumulative as, as a woman pro uh, progresses through her pregnancy. Um, and therefore, actually, by the time uh, of birth, these threats can be maximal um, and or be repeated. And you can see from these curves that often certain uh, attributes can cause mortality or severe morbid morbidity as well. So our paper, paper two, is, is structured around early pregnancy, late pregnancy and childbirth. So what I hope to do is give you a snapshot of what are some of the reviews and findings of evidence that we have in each of these categories as we go along. But for the full extent of our research, uh, I definitely recommend you having a look at our paper two. So in the concept of early pregnancy, we identified 19 reviews on threats and barriers which reported associations with miscarriage, induced abortion, reduced and reduced access to early antenatal care. Uh, a snapshot of this is some reviews showed that an increased risk of miscarriage and low antenatal contact was associated with intimate partner violence. Low formal maternal education was associated with reduced antenatal care attendance, and there was further evidence related to life in, con in conflict and um, fragile states, and also child marriage, which associated with these adverse outcomes. Moving on now to threats and barriers which affected late pregnancy, we identified over 59 reviews on deficiencies in maternal health status, risk exposures and barriers to effective care which impacted these late pregnancy outcomes. For example, we had plenty of studies which showed um, reviews about maternal nutritional deficiencies of calcium showing an increased risk of preeclampsia, pre as well as um, pre prenatal depression having a link to increased risk of low birth weight babies. Particularly, we also found women from refugee backgrounds had higher rates of stillbirth and preterm birth than women in host country women. And lastly, our last section around childbirth, we identified over 29 reviews on threats and barriers that women face during childbirth. Migration and displacement was shown to be associated with increased perinatal mortality. We also found um, results that adolescent pregnancies and low middle income countries were less likely to give birth in healthcare facilities and therefore along the vulnerability trajectory were more likely to have adverse outcomes. So I appreciate that was a, probably a really quick uh, snapshot of some of the evidence we found. But how can these vulnerabilities be repaired? So reparative strategies that tackle various vulnerability factors uh, require a life course approach. And there is a need to address the intellect, interlinking factors affecting women's health that occurs pre-pregnancy, during pregnancy, and even beyond. In our paper, we identified a summary of the evidence of RCTs um, which showed uh, an effect of a reparative interventional studies. For example, uh, notably, we had um, maternal nutritional deficiencies showing uh, supplementation has showed improved outcomes, as well as um, smoking sensation programs and physiological support showing increased um, or reduction in threat of the risk exposure. We also um, highlighted that, that community-based education interventions were really important, as well as financial incentive programs, and as well as co um, contraceptive promoting interventions in these low middle income countries showed to have increased, uh, showed to have an increased effect on maternal uh, mortality and morbidity being tackled in these local um, settings. So overall, our summary of our paper, we wanted to call for all the policymakers to understand the concept of vulnerability, to justify the access of increased resources to women at this country level in order to improve their maternal health. 
We wanted them uh, to prioritize women's access to education and empowerment through training programs to end, allowing them to enter the workforce. And as well as investing in contraceptive uptake programs, which we know have a, a good reparative strategy, is a good reparative strategy. Focusing now on healthcare professionals and what we would like them to focus on, we would want them to be able to capture these vulnerability factors um, in the care plans and being able to communicate this to other healthcare professionals and also their patient population groups. We want to be able to uh, encourage them to use locally validated tools to identify these vulnerability points in order to help target um, and provide coping strategies. And we wanted to, to emphasize a shift in care approach from a syndromic management to more about risk assessment and also being able to target interventions for, for patients specifically, as well as mapping additional care that is required in their, in their particular healthcare setting. And finally, for us researchers, we want, we want us to focus on robust standardized data to help identify vulnerability factors and their interactions, allowing them to evaluate programs that help us to scale up these evidence-based recommendations on a more recommendations on a more global level and or even an individual level. Um, we want us to be able to identify and expand to root causes of mistreatment during childbirth, because we know this is a this particular area that where women um, on the vulnerability trajectory are very um, have very high levels of morbidity and mortality to help transform and improve healthcare systems and improve health workers practices as well as the main focus is about empowering women's voices as central to the efforts in our research and in the policy making to address these vulnerabilities and improve pregnancy outcomes so just a key some few key messages Vulnerability in maternal health is centered around threats, barriers, and reparations with, with constant interactions with each, with each other. And this determines a woman's vulnerability trajectory along the pregnancy journey. And this is something in the back of her mind that's important to, to appreciate. Policymakers, healthcare professionals, and researchers have an ethical obligation to, to use this vulnerability concept to help us improve uh, uh, in, and to improve pregnancy outcomes overall. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity to talk. I'm happy to answer any questions in the chat. Thanks so much, Jamila, for that lovely, thought-provoking, uh, very clear presentation. We really appreciate you uh, coming along today to share those findings. Um, and I'm just going to take a little bit of license here as the chair. Um, I'm just posting in the chat a link uh, to another paper um, that Jamila published uh, very recently in The Lancet on interactions of race, uh, race ethnicity, and perinatal outcomes. Really, again, very thought-provoking stuff. And um, I just want to point out that while Jamila's earlier in her research career, I think you're already having a really significant impact in, in how we think about these issues of inequity. So thank you again, Jamila, um, for being here today. Um, we are just going to break for just a moment um, uh, Dr. Anoma, unfortunately, will need to step away at some point. And we've already had a couple of quite thoughtful questions um, pitched at her. And I thought we could just um, give Anoma the floor for a couple of minutes, um, Anoma, on these questions, if you don't mind. Hello. I think this is the question on uh, teenage uh, pre uh, MMR, on teenage yeah. pre adolescent. Yeah. Yeah. That's it, and one then, on family planning services um, yeah. and how you approach that in terms of MMR reduction. And yes, looking at adolescents uh, from, yeah. uh, from an MMR perspective. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Just And then uh, actually this is whatever the MMR I presented was estimates. Uh, so when you go to the country level, actually when they're having MPDSR system, then they get the uh, all these uh, uh, MMR data according to the age breakdown as also causes and then also unmet need for family planning. What I have presented today is on estimates at, at the global level, what they do in the uh, interagency estimate. So that's why this MPDSR system is extremely important. Recently, we had a, a meeting in Kathmandu jointly with the UNICEF uh, ROSA office that was on uh, adolescent pregnancies. Uh, so we found that uh, the, their adolescent uh, mortality also high in some countries. It depends on the adolescent fertility also high, adolescent mortality also high. And then, but some countries adolescent fertility high, but yet the system 
is managed in the motility is not high. So then I think it's extremely important area, but we need this data at country level. And then most countries, I think it's available if the MD MPDSR system is happening. And the family planning, actually that data I'm having for the 2018 estimates. So because we used to do some estimates with the MMR and the unmet need, and then how much maternal death can be averted by if you address the unmet need. So mm -hmm. that simple estimate is not a simple estimate, but we can do with the modeling. And then uh, we are planning to do for 2020 uh, MMR also. And then also, I think the next MMR will release next year. And then, uh, so how much family planning can be contribute uh, for the, uh, the reduction of maternal mortality ratio? So because it's depend on the country unmet need and the MMR also, but still, uh, in 2018 estimate, in some countries, even 30% of maternal deaths can be prevented by the addressing in the unmet needs, especially for spacing and limiting, and in the specific areas of postpartum family planning. So I hope I try to answer, I answered it to some extent. Thank you. No, thanks very much, Anoma. I, I really appreciate that. And I think important for us all to remember that, you know, family planning, contraceptive services, you know, it's not just their benefits in terms of preventing pregnancies and therefore preventing maternal death, but, you know, their incredibly potent role as, um, you know, as economic measures, as social participation measures, as keeping um, young people in school uh, as well. And all those, you know, direct and indirect effects, I think it really touches on a lot of the um, vulnerabilities that, um, that Jamila spoke to and indeed the the super de determinants that Rintaro spoke to as well. So I really appreciate that person's question, um, bringing family planning into the picture. Um, thank you, Anoma. We'll um, push on with our, our program. Um, and it's uh, my very great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Tipawan uh, Livasutrakul. Um, she is a professor at the Faculty of Medicine at the Prince of Songkhla University in Thailand. Um, there, she's also the head of the Department of Epidemiology um, and she's also the director of the WHO Collaborating Centre for Research and Training on Epidemiology. Um, she has postgraduate degrees, not just in epidemiology, but also in obstetrics and gynaecology. Um, Tipawan has worked on healthcare reform, reproductive maternal newborn health services, evidence-based medicine, surveillance systems. Um, and she's worked on these issues in a range of countries, not just across Asia, but also uh, into other regions as well. Um, she's a... a an old colleague of mine as well. So it's my very great pleasure, uh, Tipawan, to hand over to you for your presentation. Okay, thank you very much, Joss. Okay, so good afternoon from Thailand. Okay, so I am presenting on this papers on behalf of our team contribution that you can see the names and also the picture on this slide. Accelerating the reduction of the maternal mortality ratios has been a singular focus on maternal health community for decades. International, regional, and national strategy and preventions have prioritized intervention strategy to combat acute obstetric emergency, such as hemolytic, hypertensive disorder of pregnancy, and sepsis. These efforts have collectively helped to reduce global mortality ratio. However, mainly the long term and often chronic complications that arising directly from labor and childbirth are comparatively less visible or completely ignored. Conditions such as depression, urinary and anal incontinence, and sexual dysfunctions can be caused or exacerbated by pregnancy and childbirth, but may only present months, even years later. By this time, Women are no longer assessing postpartum care services. Historically, these services are mostly only available up to six weeks after birth. These conditions can have 
lifelong health burdens, as well as social and economic consequences. This paper aims to explore the spectrums of medians and long-term complications that can arise from the processes of labor and childbirth with a specific interest on implication for women and provider in low and middle income countries. And to systematically identify and summarize epidemiological data on burden and high quality clinical guidelines on their prevention, identifications and treatment. From this figure, you can see that they have the interlinkage from preconception, pregnancy, childbirth, and postpartum, which interpin the interplay the factors and labor and childbirth related complications, both intrinsic and extrinsic factors that makes the woman susceptible to develop these complications tend to increase with labor durations and occur beyond six weeks, as well as subsequent pregnancy. This scoping review identified 53 data sources, including seven representative household surveys or large maternity register, and 46 systematic reviews of prevalence or incident data. Among these, you can see that two related to be high quality, six moderate quality, 12 low quality, and 26 critically low quality. What's the result of this paper file? You can see that the most prevalent of the medians and long-term condition from available data. High quality review reported this pioneer that is difficult or painful sexual intercourse in 35%, which vary by time since birth. Annual incontinence symptoms were reported in women giving birth vaginally in 19% at over one year after birth. We also identify several moderate quality reviews for urinary incontinence range from 8% to 31%. Approved prevalence of postpartum anxiety disorder seems stable over time since birth, approximately.